Good morning. This is uh, Rex Haberman from the University of Florida. Uh, so this is my second talk on this uh, for this uh, group. And I'd like to thank Dr. Comer and University of Kentucky for their work in getting this all put together. And uh, this morning, um, I wanted to talk about autoimmune inner ear disease. Um, so as a, as a subspecialty surgeon, it's, um, this topic has been interesting to me for many years, uh, although I have to immediately say, give a disclaimer, is that I'm not a rheumatologist, so I don't um, understand or do a lot of the testing that they do, um, but I'm going to do my best in terms of trying to explain it from an otologist perspective. Okay. So autoimmune inner ear disease um, has uh, been around for a while, actually. Uh, Brian McCabe at the University of um, Iowa, should be proposed by uh, McCabe in 1979. So he um, had a, a group of patients with uh, bilateral sensory neural hearing loss, but was not sure why. And, and um, he was fairly aggressive in terms of working this up and trying to identify causes. Uh, back in the late 1970s and early 1980s, uh, there was um, a big or a, a push of some sort towards diagnosing things like perilent fistula and other conditions that might uh, cause sensory nerve hearing loss. Uh, but he proposed that there's an autoimmune uh, characteristic to these patients and uh, basically showing that there was uh, improvement in the audiograms with steroids, but uh, remarkably, I thought, is that uh, he was able to treat some of these patients with uh, cyclophosphamide uh, chemotherapy agent uh, back in the 1970s. But he did show that there was some improvement, and so he, he was one of the first to uh, uh, come up with the diagnosis of autoimmune inner ear disease. So Jeff Harris has been writing about this for a long time. In the 1990s, then, he described... Um, circulating antibodies against inner ear antigens with using Western blot testing, and was one of the first people to show this and publish about this. Um, for, there may be some diagnostic testing available for, at that time uh, to make the diagnosis. Um, so Mosicki then later <clears throat> correlated these antibodies with the activity of the disease and responsiveness. So it goes from the basically around 1980 to 1990, uh, there was uh, discussion about this condition without much in the way of uh, laboratory testing or much in the way of, of uh, uh, making the, or guidance in terms of making the diagnosis. So it's actually relatively rare. I mean, if, if you look at all of central neuro hearing losses, it's uh, less than 1% uh, incidence of five cases per 100,000. Um, so... More, more prevalent in women and commonly presenting in between the third and sixth decade. Uh, so it's not one of those things that was on the top of people's lists when they have patients coming in with central nerve hearing losses. Um, I think that it's one of the diagnoses that I would uh, like to recommend you consider on keeping the differential for, for central nerve hearing loss. Uh, the pathogenesis is not completely understood and is not really proven. There has been uh, some animal model studies done that have uh, uh, proposed mechanisms. Um, but basically it's some sort of combination between cell mediated and humoral response against inner ear antigens. So um, keep in mind that we're as us as otolaryngology or otology that what we want to do is be able to diagnose this clinically, and we're going to get into that. So in terms of pathogenesis, uh, there is this recognition of self-antigens, for example, Copeland is one of them, by the innate cells of the endolymphatic sac. So it leads to activation and promotion of, of the inflammatory response, including these mediators, uh, ICAM and IL-1 beta. Um, activated lymphocytes then proliferate and pursue T helper cells response leading to the release of antibodies and immune-mediated tissue injury. So 
it's probably a com uh, com consequence of vascular injury uh, due to immune complex deposition. Um, there's autoantibodies related microthrombosis and vascular changes involving electrical disturbances and impaired neurosignaling. Uh, so vascular injury seems to be the main uh, focus of the pathogenesis. On a, if you look at the diagram, this is an interesting diagram, especially uh, with if you look at Reiser's membrane. So um, the sequelae of the, of the disease is the degeneration of the striovascularis and spiroganglion atrophy of the organ of cordy, and then collapse of Reiser's membrane. And why I say that's interesting is because if you think of Meniere's disease and you look at Reiser's membrane, you would expect that to be expanded more like a ballooning of Reiser's membrane, whereas in autoimmune inner ear disease, you're seeing more of a collapse of, of Reiser's membrane. Um, there's also distortion of, tector, of the tectorial membrane, um, but um, obviously we don't have an exact way to be able to look at this with imaging or, or any sort of other way, but um, uh, I find it interesting about Reiser's membrane. All right, let's get into clinical features. Um, this is really gets into the what, how the nuts and bolts of this when you see it in the clinic. So there's hearing loss is the major um, uh, feature, uh, centering or hearing loss. There's also vestibular symptoms, tinnitus, and ear fullness. The last bullet point is very important because uh, there's a, up to 30% of these cases are associated with systemic autoimmune disease. So. If you think about that, then you have to be thinking, well, okay, these people are coming in with these with progressive hearing loss, and uh, a, a third of them, up to a third of them, might have systemic autoimmune disease. But if you look at the symptoms, hearing loss, vestibular symptoms, tinnitus, earfulness, um, clearly, you start thinking of Meniere's disease. So we have Meniere's disease, we have autoimmune disease, uh, and perhaps other conditions that can be hard to uh, figure out which is which. Uh, but with this condition, with autoimmune inner ear disease, uh, it's, it's typically bilateral uh, uh, and asymmetric uh, and also fluctuating. But some of the things that make it differentiate it from sudden hearing loss or Meniere's disease um, is that it, may, it usually occurs over weeks to months. So you have a progressive bilateral asymmetric, fluctuating, but progressive uh, centering or hearing loss. Uh, it can be unilateral at onset, but most people eventually have uh, bilateral disease. So it, this is then would be in contrast to Meniere's disease, where you, have, you do have fluctuating hearing loss, but that is over years. And you can document that uh, with serial audiograms. And then of course, sudden centering or hearing loss, which occurs uh, usually over a day or even maybe over a couple of days uh, with uh, usually unilateral uh, progressive centering or hearing loss. Or not progressive, but uh, uh, severe to profound hearing loss uh, oftentimes. So about 50% of patients have vestibular symptoms. And this again uh, can be where it can be difficult to differentiate um, autoimmune inner ear disease uh, from Meniere's disease because of episodic uh, vertigo. <clears throat> but the vertigo can be positional. You can have a disequilibrium, should be a Y there. And then uh, ataxia with nystagmus. Um, but the main point I wanna talk about here is that you can have the exact same picture of uh, with autoimmune in ear disease that you do with Meniere's disease with uh, asymmetric um, low frequency or flat central nerve hearing loss with episodic vertigo masking or mirroring Meniere's disease. So you really have to be paying attention to the natural history of this disease. Uh, tinnitus is also common, relatively common, about 25% of patients have it. Um, so the one thing that you can use to differentiate that from Meniere's disease is because of the aggressive course of the sensory nerve hearing loss. Um, so you have patients with tinnitus, vertigo, um, but with Meniere's disease, where it's fluctuating, it's going up and down with autoimmune inner ear disease, it typically will fluctuate but go down. So you have a progression over time um, rather than a return back to more of a baseline condition for the patient. 
Cogan syndrome is a, a subtype of autoimmune inner ear disease with uh, has been written about a lot uh, associated with uh, interstitial keratitis and audio vestibular dysfunction. Um, so, and then they may have systemic vasculitis. But this is uh, one of the classic kind of presentations of autoimmune inner ear disease. Seems to show up on uh, 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 in-service exams and board exams and things like that. So what do we do about diagnosis? And this is, um, we think about, um, you have a patient come in your, your office or clinic and they have progressive hearing loss and how do we make this diagnosis? Well, the, one of the problems we have is there's no standardized diagnostic criteria or reli reliable pathognomonic tests. So they're based upon uh, factors, like three factors. The clinical evaluation, demonstration of progressive central nerve hearing loss, and the response to steroids. So this is the current state of affairs um, and how we make this diagnosis. Um, again, it's the, your clinical evaluation and the demonstration of hearing loss, and that, but importantly, is then the response to steroids. So <clears throat> Harris uh, said you can make the diagnosis by meeting two, two requirements, uh, which is listed on this slide. You can read through the slide. Uh, but basically what we're saying, what he's saying is that um, uh, when, when you get improvement in sensory hearing loss with treatment with steroids uh, and improvement in word recognition, then that is an indication that it's autoimmune inner ear disease. Um, and then also no additional uh, loss or decrease in word should be recognition score. But um, uh, in this paper, some of the papers use word identification scores, so WIS is sometimes in the literature. Um, so that's the Harris requirement. And then there's Barocco criteria, uh, the group from Spain. Um, and then you have the major criteria, the minor criteria and they're also listed here. Uh, so with, in his major criteria, he was doing blood testing, um, looking for systemic autoimmune disease, and also uh, CBC testing, uh, and then looking for hearing recovery rate of greater than 80%. So, and then you really, on the left side of the slide, you see the three positive major, two positive mi major, and two positive minor required for diagnosis. So these are two criteria that have been uh, written about and are published in the literature in terms of making the diagnosis. And then the Roush criteria, which is uh, from Mass Eye and Ear, um, where it's a little bit, uh, I think, based more on audio audiometric testing, uh, bilateral central nerve hearing loss of at least 30 dB at any frequency with progression. So 15 dB at one frequency, 10 dB in two consecutive frequencies, on serial autograms performed three months apart. And he also mentioned excluding uh, retrocochlear disease by MRI scan. So um, that is part of the evaluation and workup. So when you now try to put this into an algorithm, um, there's, uh, we're gonna talk about an algorithm that is, um, that kind of combines the existing literature that's out there and then uh, make, we'll, we'll make some proposals. Uh, sort of history of physical exam uh, with audiogram, uh, which leads you then to get an MRI scan. We're gonna propose that you uh, order uh, CBC, uh, SED rate, and then anti uh, heat shock protein 70 testing, um, as well as consider consulting rheumatology. We'll, we'll talk about these in more detail. So your audiograms can be all over the place. So you can have, uh, here you have a left ear with kind of a flat central nerve hearing loss and a right profound uh, central nerve hearing loss. Uh, but you can see audiograms like this. You can see audiograms that are uh, sloping with high frequency hearing loss, low frequency hearing loss. Um, but the, the typical pattern uh, or a common pattern is a progressive uh, across the board central nerve hearing loss. Um, there's uh, papers uh, published also that talk about if there's accompanying vertigo, it might uh, suggest that you have a worse prognosis. Um, when you have a situation with an audiogram like this, or you have an audiogram with asymmetry, uh, 
as you all know, we're gonna to try to rule out retrocochlear disease. Um, interestingly, there's a, a paper by Lobo that shows uh, that intertympanic gadolinium may show that there's lighting up the endolymphatic sac or endolymphatic hydrops. So we don't do that. I don't know if anybody else that does that in practice, but I find it interesting that there's been a publication that's showing uh, uh, use of intertympanic gadolinium with um, uh, diagnosis for autoimmune inner ear disease. Basically, our MRI scan is done at this point uh, to rule out retrocochlear disease. So now we've said, okay, there's these uh, clinical presentations, there's uh, papers published about making diagnosis, and, but is there anything that we can, can we say that there's anything you can order, any lab test or any kind of uh, serologic marker that is a good one for this condition? Uh, well, it's debatable. There's a lot, there is discussion in the literature about <clears throat> that um, there may or may not be uh, uh, good markers, but the uh, anti-heat shock protein 70 has been evaluated as a, as a diagnostic serologic markers. So we're, gonna, we're working on a paper now to hopefully get published, um, uh, looking at uh, all the, the, a variety of publications and evaluations of this test. And we have found that there may be up to a 90% specificity uh, with this marker, with the anti-heat shock protein 70. Um, sensitivity is 75%, specificity 98%. Well, that seems pretty good. So if you have a, if you have a test that is 98% specific, then you can say, okay, that's something that we would consider including in our evaluation and workup. So it is commercially available. There's one commercially available test called the Otoblot TM. Uh, at the University of Florida, we order it. Uh, it actually gets sent out to, I think, Mayo Clinic Laboratories. So uh, I order it on my patients that I'm um, considering uh, autoimmune and ear disease. Um, the one thing that we use this test for is that it's a predictor of steroid responsiveness. So we're gonna, uh, we're gonna talk about it in a few minutes about um, steroid responsiveness versus steroid non-responsiveness. Um, however, about three quarters of 75% who tested positive do respond to steroids, whereas 18% are tested negative respond to steroids. So it seems to be a good predictor uh, in terms of number one, spe being specific for autoimmune disease, uh, inner ear disease, but also whether or not they're gonna respond to steroids. There's other uh, tests, other markers that can be used, but these uh, tests are uh, antibody tests basically that are not so uh, commercially available. Um, they've just been written about and published in the literature. Um, there's one in particular, uh, the anti endothelial cell antibodies, a marker showed a poor prognosis. But again, these are uh, the point here is that there are other, there are other markers uh, out there that have been studied. And there are future biomarkers with uh, micro RNA profiles. Um, so who knows, it may be that in the future that's what we use to, to make a diagnosis, but again, at this point, they're not um, readily available and uh, not you know, commercially available for the most part. So what do we do? So we have the patient, you know, you have them in your clinic and you are considering that they may be uh, potentially have autoimmune inner ear disease. This is what we're recommending uh, be considered. Uh, you run these labs. Uh, CBC and the um, SED rate and also the heat shock protein 70 test. So for, from an otolaryngology perspective, we feel like those are gonna give you um, uh, good information in terms of uh, making the diagnosis if you've already used the other criteria that are published and you want laboratory evidence that it exists, then we feel like the heat shock protein 70, CBC, and SED rate should be ordered. Um, if the SED rate is elevated, at that point then, um, we're gonna expect or consider that rheumatology is gonna order a, a whole series of tests. Um, I'm uh, working with the, the rheumatology department here um, 
uh, with, all of, with all of our patients that we suspect with autoimmune disease. So once I suspect based on clinical grounds that they have autoimmune disease, I uh, will consult rheumatology, uh, but also order the um, heat shock protein 70, CBC, and CEDRATE. So that's kind of our, our basic kind of evaluation uh, plus the rheumatology consult. Uh, when they get to rheumatology and they're considering that they have systemic disease or they might have systemic disease, or if the SED rate is elevated when they get there, or if they have decreased lymphocyte counts, then uh, we expect that rheumatology is gonna run a battery of tests that are listed uh, below in the bottom part of the slide. Um, as I said earlier, about up to 30% is, is an autoimmune inner ear disease, a secondary to a systemic autoimmune disease, um, such as lupus and GPA and other things. Um, so with uh, comor these other uh, existing uh, autoimmune disease, then rheumatology is a very important part of the, of the treatment team. And um, uh, they're going to go through uh, a very uh, detailed uh, work up uh, just uh, to find out if, if they do have or, or uh, make a diagnosis of other autoimmune diseases. Sometimes people will come in with an existing diagnosis, rheumatoid arthritis or something like that, and uh, it tips you off that, they're, that the problem is autoimmune inner ear disease already. So, but the laboratory test that I presented in the earlier slide gives you an idea what you might order in patients that come in with no history of autoimmune disease. Uh, this slide just kind of goes over targets, uh, potential targets uh, of the treatments and how we're gonna be um, blocking and, and modulating inflammatory pathways. So uh, let's just say now we have the, uh, we've made a diagnosis of, uh, of autoimmune inner ear disease and now what do we do? Um, this is where it gets interesting because um, as uh, otolaryngologists and otologists, we are surgical specialists and uh, to um, make a diagnosis and then uh, prescribe lengthy medical treatments uh, that have uh, a variety of side effects, uh, it's something that we may or may not choose to do or want to do. But um, one, one thing I wanna keep in mind is all of these patients are at this point, if we've made a diagnosis, uh, are part of the rheumatology clinic and also part of the otolaryngology clinic. So they'll see the otologist and they'll also see the rheumatologist. I try to get rheumatology to order the prednisone. Uh, rheumatology tries to get the otologist to order the prednisone because um, uh, if you look at what we're recommending, it's a very long course of prednisone and there's, uh, we get a significant amount of callbacks regar regarding uh, side effects. But basically, if uh, we have um, the testing in, has been done and we're making the clinical diagnosis based upon history, physical exam, imaging study, laboratory, um, and audiometric results, and we've said we're making that diagnosis, then the first thing we're gonna do is try to determine whether or not they're steroid responders or, not, or steroid non-responders. That's one of the first things we wanna to try to determine. So we'll start a four week trial of prednisone at one milligram per kilogram per day. Uh, you, uh, in four weeks, we're gonna do another audiogram, but uh, there's been some discussion about whether or not you should do it in two weeks. Um, I will do with some patients, um, we'll um, have callbacks that will get information that they're actually getting better within a couple of weeks. If we can document that, that's a good sign of steroid responsiveness. Uh, let's just take the first to go to the right of this algorithm and we talk about steroid responders. So we're, we're gonna try to uh, complete the, the full dose of the of prednisone um, until they plateau. So let's just say that they're getting improvement with um, uh, a milligram per kilogram per day, um, and they're uh, within, let's just say, two months or something like that, they plateau. Then at that point, we're gonna start, we're going to a lower dose uh, for up to six months. And we say with audiology every two weeks, which is uh, very difficult with 
to do in the with uh, in audio, you know with your audiology department. But um, if you have um, uh, some people uh, were exploring options or using iPads maybe to use uh, during home audiograms. There's a variety of uh, uh, applications that that are possible. So it may be possible if patients are able to do uh, home audiograms or get you data uh, on a on a biweekly basis. It might even be more helpful. But if you think about the steroid responders now, off to the right side of this slide, uh, we're talking about a, a fairly a very long course of oral steroids, and then uh, keeping them on them for six months um, at a plateau. So now. We also know that after time, patients start to lose their responsiveness to steroids. So uh, once they start to lose their responsiveness to steroids, we're gonna bring rheumatology back on board uh, to talk about other options. Um, uh, I, I shouldn't say that they're gonna bring them back on board because we're gonna, they're gonna be seeing us and seeing rheumatology throughout the steroid course. And if, if they're able to tolerate the steroids, then we're, um, you know, hopefully we'll work in conjunction or cooperation with them. All right, now let's just take, go to the left side part of the algorithm slide and say, now we have people that have no improvement uh, using uh, a high dose steroids over a four week trial and basically no improvement or they're progressively, progressively getting worse. This is where we think that we need to shift gears. And, um, so at that point, what we would recommend is tapering steroids over two weeks and then working with rheumatology to start anachyndra, uh, a biologic agent. So uh, I'll talk about that in a few more minutes about there's some promising data about that. So we're, what I would tell you is that this algorithm is, uh, well, we're going to be submitting this for publication, but um, this would be a new approach or a new way to look at this. Uh, the mainstay of treatment uh, at this point in time has been prednisone and then other immunosuppressive agents at the bottom of the slide that uh, are managed by rheumatology. And we'll talk about that also in a few minutes. But what we're going to be proposing is that if they're steroid non-responders, we'd like to start biologics, specifically anachyndra, to see if they get a response. So... Um, um, that you have to have a good working relationship with your rheumatology department uh, to get that done. So uh, we're in the process of working, uh, working through this right now, uh, but hopefully um, this will be considered in the future. Uh, this is just a slide just showing about how steroids work. Um, a couple of key points here uh, is that uh, about 70% of patients may respond to steroid therapy, but uh, even if they do respond, uh, the response to, to the steroids, the response to the steroids tends to be um, lower over time. So then you have, uh, they basically lost their the treatment effect. Um, and finally, about the anti uh, heat shock protein 70 test, if that's positive, then you have a good indication that steroids are going to be working. So uh, for me, as a otologist, uh, I do a lot of intertympanic treatment. And so one of the questions that we tried to figure out, what, what is the place for intertympanic steroids, which would seem to make a lot of sense, uh, considering that we're uh, asking patients to go on prolonged oral prednisone. I mean, is there a place for intertympanic steroids and how do we do it? And the problem is that there's a, really, there's a lack of ran randomized controlled trials. Uh, really studying the effect of intratympanic versus oral steroids in autoimmune disease. Now, having said that, because you all understand how this works through the round window, uh, it seems to me that um, over time, if we can start to study this better, it may be that we replace the oral steroids or maybe um, do it in conjunction with oral steroids or maybe shorten the oral steroid course uh, to and, and then in, in um, use intertympanic steroids uh, instead of oral prednisone. But we really don't know exactly where this fits in. We're trying to actually determine and figure this out. Um, my hope is, is that over time, that we're finding that intertympanic steroids may be, we may be able to use that 
um, uh, instead of uh, oral prednisone. Intratympanic dexamethasone, you can inject uh, at various doses. It could be four, 10, um, higher up to 24 milligrams per ml. So there is, we have some variability in terms of concentrations, but it's typically very well tolerated um, uh, and you can do it repeatedly. So one of the future studies that we're hoping to do or hoping that someone will do will be to compare oral prednisone versus intratympanic steroid injections uh, to see how they respond. Of course, uh, if there's no response um, with intratympanic, then uh, that, would, that would not be such good news. So now chemotherapy has also been used for many years. Uh, I, as I talked about, McCabe uh, first proposed using cyclophosphamide. But the mainstay of is for, uh, chemotherapy or immunosuppressive drugs has been methotrexate. Uh, they're also the other ones listed. Uh, uh, when we talk to rheumatology, rheumatology in their literature is, is suggestive that these chemotherapy agents really don't have any effect on curing. So the results have been ambiguous, um, but, and there's really a lack of multicenter randomized controlled trials to establish efficacy. But uh, over time and over uh, historically, methotrexate has been the one that has been used mostly. Um, the McCabe study showed that he used uh, uh, cyclophosphamide uh, with steroids and had improvement in pure tone and also speech uh, discrimination scores. Um, but other retrospective studies have maybe not been so promising. So methotrexate is better tolerated. Um, it has a lower dropout rate due to toxicity and uh, the majority of studies have shown promising results. Um, so there has been studies showing improved hearing uh, in steroid responsive patients, but one of the major effects of methotrexate seems to be with the uh, vestibular symptoms. So you have patients that may not get that much better from hearing, but they have significant reduction in vestibular symptoms. Uh, their, their quality of life is improved and um, uh, they're happy with that. So I have quite a few patients actually that uh, take methotrexate uh, as prescribed by our rheumatology department and seem to have uh, uh, be happy with it if they tolerate the medication well. Uh, biologic agents uh, are, you know, is something that has been ta you know, talked about frequently, uh, but basically they're blocking pathways and anakinra blocks the cytokines. So, um, uh, there's been intranympanic use of biologic agents. There's been uh, parenteral use of uh, biologic agents. But anakinra seems to be the one uh, blocking the cytokines in the steroid non-responders that has promise. So um, there's these three types of um, uh, biologic agents being, uh, being investigated. Um, but the middle one, the anti-interleukin-1 beta agent anakinra is the one that we feel has the most promise. There's also TNF-alpha antagonists um, uh, that have showed some promise. There's been uh, studies using, like I said, um, either oral or uh, parenteral or intertympanic use of these that have showed uh, some promise. Um, so one of the things that we need to understand is that when patients are not responding or have lost the responsiveness to steroid or steroid or, or our steroid resistance, uh, what, is there any, anything that we can do? Um, and there have been some papers published that show overexpression of interleukin-1 interleukin beta uh, in a, a cohort of steroid resistant autoimmune inner disease patients. Um, conversely, when uh, TNF expression is high, uh, they tend to respond to steroids. So um, have, having said these things, then we have what we feel is a, uh, a good um, idea or a good plan for these steroid resistant patients treated with anakinra. There was a small clinical trial that showed that 70% uh, uh, got better. Um, uh, there was some relapse that um, occurred. But this is basically it. So we don't have other large studies, 
but we're have, we have some information that's showing promise in these patients that are steroid resistant. So when we think about steroid resistant patients, we think about uh, they're progressively getting worse bilaterally, they're losing hearing relatively quickly, and they have not responded to steroids, and they're looking like they're going to uh, have a cochlear implant. And so is there anything that we can do uh, to potentially help them? And that's the group of patients that we're talking about with anachondra. Uh, there are some other studies that are out in terms of um, um, uh, biologic agents, B cell uh, antagonists, that it may show some promise. Um, but again, most of these studies are small. Um, uh, plasmapheresis has been uh, recommended um, in the past. Uh, here we get into more complicated kind of uh, treatment options. Um, so, but it is something that has been done and show some um, effectiveness. So basically what happens is you have a situation where you're um, treating patients uh, with a variety of agents, prednisone, um, uh, you may be uh, able to uh, prescribe biologic agents or anachondra, uh, but at some point they tend to progress and we tend to lose their hearing. And then they become cochlear implant candidates at that point. Um, but it's not an easy implant, so it could be that they're technically difficult due to fibrosis, uh, or ossification is something that you have to be aware of. Um, but there is a, a group of patients that, despite what we do, are going to progress uh, to CI. And that's part of uh, uh, the, the progression of the disease. Uh, there's also some uh, future treatment options uh, that, with stem cells and viral vectors that have been talked about but um, they're really not currently available. And then also gene therapy has been discussed. Um, may have promise for the future. Uh, it seems like the inner ears are especially a good candidate for gene therapy. So I keep, uh, we'll have to stay posted re regarding um, developments with that. Um, the, main the main point about this is that uh, the benefits are correcting genetic mutations and preserving and presenting loss of specific inner ear, uh, inner ear, ear cells. Um, so, and then finally, stem cell therapy has been um, has shown some improvement, but um, uh, the efficacy is limited by hostile environment of the endolymph, so may or may not show promise in the future. Uh, now, I'm going to, uh, I'll talk in conclusion, then we'll talk about uh, sort of some specific cases, but um, uh, try to present as much information as I can in a short period of time about autoimmune inner ear disease. It's a uh, debilitating disease um, that presents with uh, uh, progressive or permanent central inner hearing loss if not recognized and treated. Uh, there is a lot of room for research and a lot of room for uh, uh, potential options in the future and future treatment modalities. But um, so one of the things that uh, happens with this situation is that you'll have the patient come in uh, with um, uh, hearing loss and they'll have maybe mild to moderate hearing loss starting out to be, uh, could be asymmetric, it could be symmetrical, uh, but you're, you make a diagnosis of central inner hearing loss you're not really too concerned about that at the time. But then they come back within a month or within a few weeks and it, you see this progression. Once you start to see that progression, that's when you start just thinking, okay, what else is going on here? So what we've tried to do here is present, um, I'm gonna back up to our algorithm. Sorry, diagnostic algorithm. So um, uh, with the asymmetric hearing loss, you'll do your MRI scan to make sure there's not a retrocochlear lesion. Um, so some people, um, and when you get to the point of the lab testing, will order ANAs or, or SED rates. Um, what we find is probably the most helpful thing to do uh, 
uh, is that if you see progressive, progressive hearing loss, progressive sensory hearing loss uh, within a short period of time, meaning a few months, that you're gonna wanna order a CBC uh, and a SED rate. And if you have the availability to order the anti-heat shock protein 70 test, that's the test that you wanna get. So now if the anti-heat shock protein 70 test is positive, then you, you're pretty much sure that that's what they have is an autoimmune inner ear disease. If the test is negative, it doesn't rule it out. Uh, but now you start to think about whether or not they're going to be a steroid responder or not. Uh, at this point, I'm consulting rheumatology and asking them to get in, uh, help us out um, with the patient. Um, but keep in mind, so you have uh, your, your serial audiograms, and they may be getting worse. And at the same time, it takes a while to get in to see rheumatology, and the patient's calling back saying that they're progressively getting worse. Um, usually, if I have a suspicion of um, steroid or of autoimmune inner ear disease, I'm going to start steroids. Uh, at the same time, I'm going to be ordering these lab tests. So, if I feel like on the on on the history physical, um, and then uh, studies after I do some studies, uh, I'm going to start them on a course of prednisone. My typical course will be to see them back in two weeks after starting the one milligram per kilogram per day of prednisone. Um, and then I need to try to figure out if that is something they're able to tolerate or they're not gonna to tolerate. Now I'll go to the other algorithm. Um, so we, we thought about recommending uh, uh, doing prednisone and then in two weeks doing an audiogram. But uh, one of the difficulties we have with patients is whether or not they're gonna have access to audiology or they travel long distances. Uh, so um, we're tr looking into and trying to figure out, um, uh, like I said, iPad uh, audiograms or something that they can do at home to get some sort of idea if they're getting a, a response. And then we need to be able to determine whether or not they're responding or not responding. <clears throat> That's really the future of this, of this condition is, at the, is, is after the initial four week course of prednisone. If they are responding, then you have, um, you continue. If they're not responding, then we need to figure out something different. If they're not responding, we're going to recommend that we work with rheumatology and start anachinra is gonna be our recommendation. If they are improving, uh, then one of the questions that I have is when I look at this algorithm is where does intertympanic steroids come in? So, I have a feeling that what's going to happen is that instead of continuing with full dose steroids, <clears throat> what we what we'd be doing is we're going to be monitoring these patients to see if they have um, if they're if they're either plateauing or they're continuing to improve, and if they're tolerating the prednisone uh, orally, that will keep them on the prednisone. But if they're not tolerating the prednisone, we need to have another option, and that's where I feel like intrapanic steroids. <clears throat> can be helpful. Uh, in, in, uh, but another complete option would be as you go down the uh, steroid responding uh, ar arrow, <clears throat> the, the other option is that instead of using oral prednisone, we use intrapanic steroids. This is something that we don't know the answer to, um, but we hope to be able to have an answer, uh, but it's going to take some time to figure that out. Um, Certainly from a patient compliance and from a patient uh, tolerating and treatment perspective, it would be better for us to use intratepanic steroids versus long-term uh, high dose, full dose steroids <clears throat> until they plateau. So that I think is kind of where we're stuck. Um, so whether or not we're gonna use alternate drugs um, when steroid non-responders or whether or not we're gonna use uh, the full dose steroids. <clears throat> so, and then the final thing I wanted to talk about was where do you insert methotrexate? So, um, some people, um, when they treat with prednisone, if they do get better, uh, and then they can consult, consult rheumatology, um, it's kind of the up to the rheumatologist to decide whether or not they're going to recommend uh, methotrexate. In, in our current practice, it seems like if they don't respond to prednisone, 
then the, and they go down the steroid non-responsive arrow, then that's when we'll see methotrexate being uh, offered. So, but what we're, we want to uh, interject in between the uh, methotrexate and the steroid non-responsiveness are the biologic agents. So that's, uh, that's one of the things that we're gonna find out in the next um, few, I guess, um, we're gonna find that out in the next six months or a year or whatever. Is that, are we, uh, are, is that the pathway we're gonna be able to go down? We certainly have to have the cooperation of rheumatology. Uh, I mean, obviously the biologic or expensive agents and um, we have to determine whether or not that's the way we're gonna go. Uh, however, based upon the current literature, it seems like that um, would be the, what we're gonna, that's what we're gonna recommend. <clears throat> so having said all of these things, um, it, it's, uh, it seems like it, a kind of a confusing situation. Uh, um, and where do, we, where do we go from here? Um, my feeling is, is that if you make the diagnosis of autoimmune inner ear disease, um, you, what, the first thing you're gonna do is you'll start steroids and consult rheumatology. If you have a good working relationship with rheumatology, um, you might uh, at that point have a discussion about here are, here's, here are the thoughts we have about biologics, immunosuppressive, and long-term prednisone. Conversely, um, you might have situations that come up where the rheumatologist says there is no evidence of autoimmune disease. They don't, they don't have autoimmune disease. That, that presents a kind of a difficult situation for us uh, if they don't fit any diagnostic paradigm and you have, say they don't have Meniere's disease, um, they, they, they don't have sudden hearing loss, um, they don't have presbycusis, um, they don't have other issues that are causing this, um, there's no trauma or whatever, and, but they have progressive central hearing loss without signs of systemic autoimmune disease. That's the discussion that you have to have with rheumatology about, okay, most of our patients with autoimmune disease uh, or autoimmune inner ear disease actually don't have systemic autoimmune disease. So if that's understood and you can show that with available literature, then you, you develop this working relationship and you can determine if you're gonna be able to follow these treatment algorithms. So in, in summary, that's what I would say is that uh, you have a good working relationship with rheumatology uh, and then um, uh, you, you're not afraid to recommend some of these uh, either biologic agents or immunosuppressive agents. And then uh, finally to consider where you would insert intratympanic steroids into these uh, treatment algorithms um, based upon your, uh, your, your patients and their tolerance. Uh, and finally, the last thing I will say is that I have, we have a number of patients who have very good response to um, oral steroids, but then they stop taking the prednisone or want to stop taking the prednisone uh, because of uh, side effects. Those are the ones I think that you would say, okay, at that point, I'm going to insert intratepanic steroids. Um, so that, that's another option. So I'm running up on almost 50 minutes, five zero minutes. So um, uh, I want to be able to have time if there's any questions. Uh, a lot of you may be a lot closer to um, some of the uh, basic science uh, than I am, uh, but um, I'm happy to take any questions um, uh, regarding this. Uh, okay, I have one question. Um, it's, uh, the question is, in the six month maintenance period for steroid responders, do you, do you always get the audiogram every two weeks? Was it based on subjective changes to the patient? <clears throat> um, if, the two, if the Q2 week audiograms are stable for a month or two, do you continue the entire six months or begin to taper sooner? Uh, that's a good question. So um, it's, it's not practical um, to bring patients in every two weeks for audiograms. We're trying to find ways that uh, we can get um, home audiograms uh, so that people can test on themselves and uh, uh, provide that data for us. Um, so uh, the, 
typical audiogram is every four weeks. So if you have, um, you're on a six month maintenance program and you get tested every, every month, um, and maybe that might be even hard to do. Uh, but ideally, if we could have every two weeks, we could get some idea if they're, if they've plateaued, um, or if they're, um, um, or if they're getting worse or non or no longer responding. Um, <clears throat> and then the final, do you continue the entire six month if they're stable? So um, the idea is um, that once they plateau, um, and you can demonstrate that um, you don't you don't need to continue the entire six months. Um, uh, the the recommendations that are published are based on six months, but it's also based on plateauing. So if you have, um, uh, let's just say they plateau over three months, uh, you might at that point uh, or four months you might consider going to um, uh, a, a lower dose at that point. So these are guidelines to follow. Um, the recommendation is six months, uh, but it's hard to convince patients uh, to continue to take that much prednisone if they're not getting any improvement at that point, if they're plateaued and they're no longer getting better. So I'll, at that point, I would typically then recommend um, uh, going to the more of the uh, lower dose. I hope that answers your question. And then another question is, can you go over how you differentiate this from Meniere's disease again? Okay, so, um, so Meniere's disease um, has uh, uh, episodic vertigo, 15 minutes at least, uh, outlasting up to hours with um, fluctuating low frequency sensory near hearing loss. Uh, typically associated symptoms would be low frequency tinnitus or roaring tinnitus or buzzing tinnitus um, and then aural fullness. Um, now, you can have the exact same symptoms with autoimmune inner ear disease, but there's one there's a couple of differences. With autoimmune inner ear disease, as they're fluctuating, they're also progressing. So, um, and the symptoms with the tinnitus uh, tend to be less common, the oral fullness tends to be less common, and the vestibular symptoms are also um, not always there. So, uh, but you can, they can almost look identical. The thing that you want to really differentiate it is the pro progressive aspect of the autoimmune inner ear disease, centering your hearing loss. That's, that's key. So if you can demonstrate that over time, then you can, you can be relatively certain uh, that from a, at least from a clinical uh, perspective that they have autoimmune disease. Now, having said that, I, I would want to order the blood tests. So if they come in and they have uh, asymmetric hearing loss or signs of progression, and it looks exactly like Meniere's disease, um, uh, I'm still, going to order some basic screening tests, which a SED rate obviously is very much of a screening test. CBC, same thing. <coughs> Excuse me. And then um, when do you order the heat shock protein 7, anti-heat shock protein 70 test? I order it at the same time. So I, I get the, uh, the HSP test, I get the uh, uh, SED rate test, and I get a CBC. So that's what I'm going to do if I see evidence of asymmetry with suggestion of progression, um, and that helps, it helps me to differentiate that from Meniere's disease also. So I hope that answers that question. Um, the, uh, for, for us as surgical specialists, this um, um, topic can be um, interesting. It's like going back to medical school, basic science. Uh, and I have to, when I give these talks to rheumatologists or if I talk to rheumatologists, they know so much more about the inflammatory pathways than I do. But it's, um, but they're very, actually a lot of, uh, I have one doctor here at UF in particular that has uh, demonstrated an interest in these patients. Um, once you find someone or maybe a couple of people that have, are interested in following these people with you, uh, and then you start talking about using biologic agents, everybody's eyebrows start to raise. So um, uh, the, the, for the steroid non-responders, uh, it's um, when I go to rheumatology, I say, we need to start them in anachyndra. And they're, they're, they're like, well, they don't have autoimmune disease. They have nothing. They, don't, they only have hearing loss. So it's, uh, it's an interesting discussion that we have because I'll say, no, they have, they have autoimmune inner ear disease and they're not responding to steroids. Uh, 
that means that we need to use the biologic agent. And then often the response I'll get is something like, uh, well, I'll just put on methotrexate. So they'll skip that, that biologic step of our algorithm um, because they're, they're very familiar with using methotrexate. So um, we have that discussion uh, uh, from time to time, I would say. And then the other major discussion you have with patients is the length of time with the prednisone. It's, it's brutal. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll ask rheumatology to really help uh, with, with the patients, like saying, look, can you, can you, you know, see these people? Can you talk to them about, we're talking long-term prednisone. Um, can you kind of nurse them through this um, with me? Um, usually, usually they'll do it. So I, I've had good luck with that. But um, anyway, well, thank you very much uh, for your attention to this topic. I have one more lecture I think I'm giving, which is um, uh, treat, surgical treatment of otosclerosis, which is one of my favorite talks. Um, and uh, But I'm, if there is any other questions, let me know. It sounds like you're pretty much all set. So I'm going to um, uh, sign off at this point. And uh, thank you very much for your um, uh, attention to, uh, to this talk. Thank you. Thank you, Rex. Appreciate you talking.